High above a rust-colored planet, an alien spacecraft prepares for landing. It has traveled for nearly nine months, hurtling through more than half a billion kilometers of interplanetary space. Now, as it plunges toward Mars, the robot visitor sheds its protective cocoon. Just 20 meters from the surface, it hovers, then carefully lowers itself on a specially designed hoist. For 16 seconds, the robot's fate hangs by a nylon thread. Then it touches down safely on Martian soil. Its mission has begun, a mission in the name of curiosity. When NASA was looking for a nickname for its 2012 Mars rover, it could hardly have chosen a better one than Curiosity. Eight years before, its two predecessors, Spirit and Opportunity, had proved that roving vehicles could revolutionize our understanding of the red planet. With Curiosity, rover technology had advanced, and scientists were in the driver's seat. Those scientists were guided by an ambitious goal. Previous missions had shown that in the distant past, Mars had standing water on its surface. Now, Curiosity would go one step further and try to determine if Mars could once have supported life. That's a more challenging question to answer, and researchers needed a bigger rover to answer it. At 900 kilos, Curiosity is the size of a small car, allowing it to carry 15 times more scientific hardware than previous rovers. It's the most sophisticated suite of instruments ever to land on another planet. And for the Mars program, it's a big shift in approach. Earlier rovers were designed to be like wandering geologists, traveling over the landscape of Mars with a toolkit similar to one that a human astronaut might carry. By comparison, Curiosity is an entire laboratory on wheels. Its equipment includes a laser capable of zapping rocks up to six meters away in order to read their chemical composition. And its two meter long robot arm carries a camera and a spectrometer for examining the surface up close, as well as a drill for extracting rock samples that can be tested by various experiments inside the rover. This is a planetary explorer like no other. And so is the place it set out to explore. In planning Curiosity's mission, scientists spent years combing through satellite images looking for a landing site that might offer signs of a habitable past on Mars. The search led them here, to Gale Crater. It's 150 kilometers across, with a five and a half kilometer high mountain rising from its center. Like most craters on Mars, it formed billions of years ago, when an incoming asteroid collided with the planet's surface. The force of the impact blasted a giant hole in the Martian bedrock. A crater on Mars is easy to understand, but a mountain inside a crater is much harder to explain. How could such a towering feature have grown out of a deep basin? Scientists now suspect the answer is that the mountain didn't grow at all. Rather, it was left behind as other material was removed. 
The theory is that sometime after Gale Crater formed, it was blanketed with dusty sediment. Eventually, layer upon layer of sediment filled the crater to the brim and beyond. Later, wind chiseled that sediment away. It scoured out the crater walls, but left a large mound in the middle. The mound's official name is Aeolus Mons, but NASA scientists have dubbed it Mount Sharp, after Robert Sharp, a pioneer of planetary geology. Mount Sharp is what brings curiosity to Gale Crater. Scientists hope that by climbing its rocky flanks, the rover will be able to read millions of years worth of geologic history laid down one layer at a time. Some of those layers are plainly visible from orbiting satellites. The lowest layers are the oldest. They're of special interest because the data suggest they're made of clay, which means they were likely deposited by water long ago. Moving further up the mountain, other layers may reveal how those watery conditions changed over time. The upper reaches of the mountain appear to be made up of material that was deposited by wind once the planet became dry and dusty. From top to bottom, the mountain seems to present the complete story of Mars. As soon as Curiosity landed, scientists were thrilled. Not only had the rover touched down safely, Mount Sharp was in plain sight. It towered on the horizon in one of Curiosity's first pictures from the surface. But the mountain was eight kilometers away and scientists knew it would take the rover more than a year to get there. So before the long trek began, they decided to explore Curiosity's immediate surroundings. It was to be the first test of their new laboratory on Mars, but little did they know just how much that test would reveal. When Curiosity set down on the floor of Gale Crater, it became the seventh spacecraft to land successfully on Mars. But more than any of its predecessors, Curiosity was built to journey far beyond its landing site. The rover's main objective was to reach Mount Sharp and study its layered geology. Those layers could already be seen in the distance on the mountain's lower slopes. But before heading in that direction, Curiosity had a chance to visit other points of interest closer to hand. Just a few steps from where Curiosity stood, scientists could see where the rover's descent stage had blasted away loose dust and gravel. The exposed patches showed that the soil was only a few centimeters deep in this part of the crater. Below it lay what looked to scientists like a type of conglomerate rock, a rock made up of smaller pieces cemented together. This was intriguing, but Curiosity did not venture any closer, in part to avoid contamination from any lingering traces of rocket exhaust. Instead, scientists now had a different idea. Not far from where Curiosity landed, satellite images showed where a river had once spilled into the crater. The riverbed ended in a fan-shaped deposit left behind by water spreading sediments out over the crater floor. It was always the plan to try to land near this feature 
And now, curiosity was right on the edge of it. By using the satellite imagery as a guide, scientists could see that just a few hundred meters from the landing site lay a point where the river deposit intersected with an older terrain. This looked like a promising spot to learn more about the ancient history of the crater floor, even though going there would mean driving away from Mount Sharp for a time. In the end, the detour would take far longer than scientists expected, but it would eventually lead to a big discovery. As curiosity began moving over the landscape, it came across clues that pointed to an intriguing past at Gale Crater. There were more examples of the conglomerate rock that had been exposed at the landing site, this time jutting out of the ground like pieces of broken sidewalk. And when the rover zoomed in for a closer look, it found pebbles that looked rounded as though by water. This is typical of what is found in ancient stream beds on Earth. Already, the geologic story emerging from Gale Crater looked like an exciting one, but filling in the details would take time. As they carefully gathered data, scientists were striving to understand if Mars could have supported life long ago. But given the rover's capabilities, there was also a more immediate question. Could there be something alive on Mars right now? And there was a chance that Curiosity might provide the answer by plucking it out of thin air. For 10 years, scientists had been tantalized by reports of trace amounts of methane in the Martian atmosphere. The reports were mainly based on observations made from Earth. But the presence of methane was also indirectly confirmed by Mars Express, an orbiting spacecraft run by the European Space Agency. The Earth-based observations show that the methane seemed to be concentrated around particular features on the Martian surface like these giant gashes called Neely Fossey, where spacecraft have also found signs of carbon-bearing minerals. If correct, this was a major find. On Earth, methane gas is produced by living things. It's a telltale sign of biological activity. Methane gas can also be produced chemically, but that requires the right kind of minerals along with water and plenty of heat. Either way, methane would mean that Mars was not a dead world, but a geologically and possibly biologically active one, somewhere below the surface. Now Curiosity was in a position to weigh in on Martian methane. Unlike earlier rovers, it had the technology to directly measure the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Over an eight-month period, that's exactly what the rover did. The result was a surprise. The rover found no significant amounts of methane on Mars. Either the methane reported earlier had completely vanished through some unknown process, or, because of a misreading of data, those earlier reports were wrong. This is not the first time Mars has given scientists contradictory evidence related to alien life. But with the methane question out of the way, at least for now, Curiosity still had plenty to do. And its exploration of the red planet was about to take an exciting turn at a spot called Yellowknife Bay. More than two months into its mission at Gale Crater, NASA's Curiosity rover stopped to capture a breathtaking panorama. The result is this mind-blowing 1.3 billion pixel image, 
It's the most detailed picture ever taken from the surface of Mars. By this point, the rover had driven about 400 meters. Not a great distance, but a journey with many stops that allowed scientists to gather data about the geologic history of this unusual site. To the right lay the rising slopes of Mount Sharp, the rover's ultimate destination. But straight ahead, scientists could now see a dramatic change in scenery. Here, the gravelly terrain that the rover had been traveling on since it landed ended abruptly. Up ahead lay a more complex looking surface with different layers of rock exposed in the form of assorted steps and slabs. Scientists were keen to explore this location, which they called Yellowknife Bay. The name is a tribute to the capital of the Northwest Territories, a frequent jumping off point for geologic expeditions in Canada's north. By now, they'd had a chance to zap a rock with the rover's onboard laser and scoop up some soil for analysis. But neither the rock nor the soil could tell them much about Gale Crater. That's because the rock had been blasted there by a meteorite impact, while the soil had been carried in on the wind. So to understand the hidden history of the crater, Curiosity needed some local bedrock to drill into. It began by sidling up to this intriguing outcrop made up of thin layers of sedimentary rock. Some of the layers were at different angles, suggesting the rock was made from sediments deposited by flowing water along an undulating stream bed. After a close inspection of this outcrop, Curiosity worked its way down slope to find an underlying layer of sandstone. And beneath that, the rover found still another layer. This one was mudstone, a type of rock made of fine silt or clay that was deposited long ago, perhaps at the bottom of an ancient lake. The rock was threaded with veins of minerals, that were deposited by water flowing through cracks. And in some places, Curiosity could see spherules, little round balls of minerals that precipitated out of water. Here were signs not only of rock that formed in water, but that had been exposed to water at different times in its history. And here at last, was a place where Curiosity could drill down to find out more. After carefully scouting the terrain, scientists chose a rock they named John Klein, after a deputy project manager with the rover mission who died in 2011. Using its robotic arm, Curiosity reached down and swiveled its drill into position. The drill punched a small hole into the rock, producing a tablespoon's worth of fine powder, which the arm delivered to the rover's onboard experiments for analysis. Unlike most of the Martian surface, the powder was gray rather than red in color. That meant the minerals inside the rock had been sealed off from the atmosphere for billions of years. Here was a rock that offered a direct connection to the past. In March 2013, seven months after Curiosity arrived on Mars, scientists were ready to share their results. A detailed analysis showed that the minerals in the rock had formed in water that was much like fresh water on Earth, non-acidic and not very salty. Furthermore, there were chemicals in the rock that the right kind of microbes can use to drive metabolism. Curiosity had found the key ingredients that could have allowed life to flourish when there was water in Gale Crater. 
For curiosity, this was mission accomplished. While it's still not known if Mars ever harbored life, scientists can now say life was at least possible there billions of years ago. With the discovery came the news that the rover's mission had changed. Having answered its original question, Curiosity would now try to find out where and how to search for signs of past life on Mars. By the summer of 2013, the mission reached a major turning point. After making several more follow-up measurements, scientists said goodbye to Yellowknife Bay forever and put the rover on course for Mount Sharp. The first phase of the mission was over, and there were new discoveries ahead. But before it left, Curiosity provided its own glimpse of life on Mars by using its robot arm to take this striking self-portrait at John Klein Rock. It may be a long time yet before we know if there ever really was life on Mars. But we know that curiosity is there, and that's a terrific start. For our prehistoric ancestors, recognizing patterns was a key to survival. As they made their way in the world, they saw patterns in the landscape, patterns in the weather, and patterns in the behavior of birds and animals. And when they looked up at the night sky, they saw patterns too. What they found is that the stars aren't spread evenly across the sky. Many of the brightest stars seem to be grouped in a way that naturally draws the eye. And as Earth turns, these stars seem to move together, reinforcing the impression that they are related. By playing connect the dots with these groups of stars, ancient people transformed them into pictures, often of mythical creatures and characters from great legends. We know them as the constellations. The constellations are still with us today and they're a reminder of our ancestors' enduring fascination with the stars. But there can be even more to these ancient star pictures than meets the eye. Sometimes, the stars we see together in the sky really are related. A case in point is one of the most familiar star patterns of them all, the Big Dipper. The name reflects the way these seven stars are arranged in the sky. Together, they resemble the outline of a pot with a handle. There are other ways of seeing it, though. In some folk traditions, it's not the dipper, but the wagon or the plow. And for the ancient Greeks and Romans, it was the great bear, Ursa Major in Latin, the official name astronomers still use for this constellation. 
To modern eyes, turning these stars into the image of a bear seems a bit of a stretch. The bear is usually portrayed with the handle of the Big Dipper as its long tail, even though real bears don't have long tails. But the bear connection makes more sense when we consider that the ancient Greeks called this constellation Arctos, a name that gives us the word Arctic. Arctos, or Ursa Major, may be our link to a much older tradition of bear legends, one that stretches back to the end of the last ice age, when the inhabitants of Europe and Asia were nomads wandering in a great northern wilderness. Perhaps they were the ones who first connected the most powerful animal in their world to the most prominent star pattern in their sky. So it seems fitting that in more recent times, astronomers have learned that the stars of the Big Dipper are themselves a wandering band of stellar nomads. This became clear in 1869, when British astronomer Richard Proctor noticed that five out of the seven main stars in the Dipper are all moving through space at the same speed in the same direction, like airplanes flying in formation. Proctor had discovered what we now call the Ursa Major Association. Half a billion years ago, these stars formed together in a cloud of gas and dust. Today, we can find the same kind of raw material adrift in other regions of our galaxy. One of the nearest is called the Taurus Molecular Cloud. In this gorgeous view from the European Southern Observatory, we can see sections of the cloud wafting across the starry background. Over time, gravity can concentrate dark clouds like this, turning them into clusters of brilliant young stars. But even though they are siblings, such stars are unlikely to stay together forever. Instead, star clusters tend to spread apart as they drift through the galaxy. And that means the Ursa Major group may be a lot bigger than it seems, extending well beyond the five Big Dipper stars that Proctor once connected. Even Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, was once thought to be a member of this group. More recent data now suggest it's too young to have formed along with the Ursa Major Association. In 2003, a detailed survey based on data from the Hipparchos satellite found that 59 stars are likely members. These stars are scattered across 30 light years of space, with the center of the group located about 80 light years from our solar system. In galactic terms, this is remarkably close. It's purely by chance that our existence happens to coincide with the moment when Earth is on the outskirts of this passing system. Millions of years from now, those stars will have moved on, and the Big Dipper will be no more. But astronomers have discovered that Ursa Major is not the only constellation with a hidden connection among its stars. Throughout history, when adventurers and traders headed east or west to distant lands, they knew they were bringing their constellations with them. As Earth turns, places on the globe that are at similar latitudes, like Europe, Asia, and North America, will see the same stars. But those who travel south experience something very different. Earth doesn't turn north to south, so there are stars and constellations that can never be seen from northern latitudes. It's here in the south that we find Centaurus. It's a sprawling constellation that the ancient Greeks pictured as a spear-wielding centaur, 
the imaginary creature that is half man, half horse. Like Ursa Major, the great bear, the outline of the centaur may not seem obvious to modern eyes. But there's no mistaking the two brightest stars in this constellation, known as Alpha and Beta Centauri. Together, they point to another group of four stars, which the ancients also imagined as part of the centaur. Today, we identify this group as a separate constellation, and it's one of the most famous, the Southern Cross. Whether it's one constellation or two, the combination of the Southern Cross with Alpha and Beta Centauri forms the dominant star pattern of the Southern Hemisphere. But how did the ancient Greek astronomers know about these stars, which can't even be seen from Greece? The answer is precession. It's a term that describes a gradual change in the direction of Earth's axis as our planet slowly swivels around like a big gyroscope in space. Because of precession, the stars of Centaurus and the Southern Cross have shifted over the centuries. Once, long ago, they were visible from Europe. Now they've become, for the South, what the Big Dipper is in the North. Many of the stars in Centaurus and the Southern Cross are moving through space with a similar speed and direction. But this association is far younger than the Ursa Major group, and it contains stars that are much brighter. Many are blue giant stars, thousands of times more luminous than our sun. Blue stars burn out quickly. The hottest ones only last a few million years, a tiny fraction of our sun's age. As they use up their fuel, blue stars eventually expand and change into red supergiants. This has already happened to the brightest member of the group, the brilliant red star Antares. Antares is part of Scorpius, a different constellation, but its motion connects it to the stars of the centaur and the cross. Collectively, they are the Scorpius Centaurus Association. The ultimate fate of these bright stars is to die in spectacular fashion. As each one runs short of fuel, its core will collapse, triggering a supernova. A violent stellar explosion that rips the star apart. The explosion produces a blast of energized gas that spreads out into the surrounding space for hundreds of light years. This too has already happened in the Scorpius Centaurus Association. The entire group including most of the stars of the Southern Cross, sit inside a bubble about 400 light years across. Astronomers suspect the bubble was formed by one or more of the association's stars going supernova during the past 15 million years. The bubble can't be seen with an ordinary telescope, but in this map of the Milky Way in radio waves, part of it shows up as a giant loop in the foreground. Astronomers call it Loop 1. Our own solar system lies just outside Loop 1 in another smaller bubble. This local bubble may also have been caused by one or more supernovas, perhaps when the Scorpius Centaurus Association was closer to Earth than it is now. This idea was strengthened in 2004 when researchers discovered a rare isotope called Iron 60 in sediment deposited at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Iron 60 is produced in supernova explosions. This suggests that sometime in the last three million years, Earth was in close proximity to a supernova. Such an event may have had serious consequences for life. One group of researchers has even speculated that a major extinction of corals and other marine life about two and a half million years ago 
was caused by a supernova blasting Earth's atmosphere with radiation, temporarily destroying the ozone layer. So far, this idea remains speculative, and there are reasons to be skeptical. Astronomers have calculated that a supernova would have to be within 26 light years of Earth to cause such severe damage to our planet. While that's not impossible, a supernova going off so close to us so recently would be quite a coincidence. What we do know is that our planet did change at that time. With some creatures dying out and some new groups appearing including the first members of our own genus, Homo. Whether our pre-human ancestors were somehow affected by a nearby supernova remains an open question. But when we look to Centaurus and the Southern Cross, we're reminded that hidden connections between the stars may sometimes include us. Winter in the Northern Hemisphere is the time when many of the brightest stars can be seen high overhead. Among them are Castor and Pollux. These stars, almost identical in brightness, are the Gemini twins. They're part of a constellation that depicts two brothers in the heavens. But these stars are not related. At just 34 light years from Earth, Pollux is both closer and older than Castor, which is 50 light years away. They are siblings in name only. It's the same story with another well-known winter constellation, Cassiopeia, named after a mythical queen. The five brightest stars in Cassiopeia form a W pattern that's easy to spot in the northern sky. But in this case, the grouping is pure coincidence. The stars in the W are spread out along a line of sight that ranges from about 50 to over 500 light years away. They too are not related. Nevertheless, most stars must have relatives somewhere because stars tend to form in clusters within vast clouds of dust and gas. If we look towards the stars of the Southern Cross, we can see a recent example. Near the cross, but 6,000 light years further away, lies one of the greatest treasures of the southern sky. In the 19th century, astronomer John Herschel called this the jewel box star cluster. With its concentration of hot blue stars and bright red giants, the cluster reminded Herschel of a casket full of precious stones. Today, astronomers estimate the cluster contains about 100 stars that formed around 12 million years ago. As the cluster ages, the brightest stars will quickly exhaust their fuel and burn out, in some cases going supernova, like the stars of the Scorpius Centaurus Association. Those stars that remain will continue to travel together, like the Ursa Major group. But over billions of years, they're destined to drift apart and lose each other among the stars of the Milky Way. Our own sun is one such star. Now four and a half billion years old, it too must have relatives somewhere out there in the galaxy. Some of those sibling stars could have planets and even life. Since life here is based on the chemical ingredients that went into forming the sun, it would be fascinating to see what happened to the same ingredients elsewhere. But could we find the sun's long-lost relatives? Are they hidden somewhere among the familiar constellations? One approach to answering these questions is to look at the nearest stars and see if any have strong similarities to our sun. 
The nearest star of all is Alpha Centauri. Although it appears to the eye as a single point of light, Alpha Centauri is actually a multiple system made up of three stars in orbit around each other. The smallest is a red dwarf star, known as Proxima Centauri because it's also the closest of the three. The entire system is only 4.3 light years from us. That's still thousands of times further than the most distant planet in our solar system, but for a star, it's very, very close. In fact, it's so close that Alpha Centauri can't be a member of the Scorpius Centaurus Association. It just happens to be in the foreground when we look toward those stars. Similarly, someone living on a planet in the Alpha Centauri system would see our Sun as part of the constellation Cassiopeia, giving the W an extra zigzag. But even if such a planet exists, we already know that any creatures living there cannot be our galactic cousins. The Alpha Centauri system is older than the Sun and it's moving on its own separate course. After its closest approach, about 27,000 years from now, the system will gradually start to pull away from us and it will eventually fade into the starry background. Meanwhile, the search for our Sun's true siblings continues. In 2013, astronomers conducted a careful study of 30 stars known to have ages, compositions and motions similar to the Sun. After a close examination, only one of the 30 qualified as a possible true sibling to the Sun. It lies just over 100 light years away in the constellation Hercules. It doesn't have a name, just a catalog number, HD 162826. But this one candidate sibling could soon be joined by others. In December 2013, Europe launched the Gaia mission. It's a space telescope that will help construct a 3D catalog of nearly a billion stars, roughly 1% of the Milky Way's total stellar population. As never before, Gaia will reveal precisely where all the stars are around us and show us how they're moving. In doing so, it will reveal which stars are truly associated with one another including those that might have a connection to our Sun. Long ago, our ancestors looked for patterns in the stars and they invented the constellations, groups of stars that have a story to tell. Now Gaia is giving us a more sophisticated way of observing the stars, but we're still looking for patterns. What we find will reveal the unseen relationships among the stars around us and give us a new set of stories. It may even give us a story that includes us. The story of a great family of stars that formed together in a cloud, spread out into the galaxy, and along the way brought the galaxy to life.